I figured this was a uh, a little briefing as we compare um, revolution the, and the um, struggle for uh, liberation across the globe and associating it with a real revolution and revolutionaries who overthrew their rich uh, landlords and um, investigating what they had to say about world revolution, in particular, the uh, so-called Negro in America. So we investigated that. And uh, since we were looking at the Negro in America, so-called Negro Amer in America or the African-American, we, um, we uh, uh, compared that to the children of Israel. Why? Because what the Bolsheviks or the Russian revolutionaries were what, what they were saying and teaching concerning revolution and um, the success of the revolution, even the success of their own revolution and worldwide revolution that leads to liberation, they argue that the Negro is a decisive factor who, who's to furnish the vanguard to lead the revolution. That means take the head. And so the idea was to go into the text um, of the uh, Socialist Workers Party, go into the Bible and go into history, and uh, go into the Bible to see what was uh, the prophecy concerning the children of Israel. And then we went into history to find out, okay, well, where are the children of Israel? And it appears that the children of Israel, they are in every nation under the sun, uh, their social class, um, they are at the bottom for the most part. They're at the bottom for the most part. And um, they furnish second and third world countries and they're at the bottom globally and um the children of israel are according to the bible they are to lead the world revolution and according to the reasoning of the bolsheviks one of the reasons why the negro was so important because of his social condition so it appears that the social condition at deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, and various other passages in the law, it appears that the children of Israel will be put in a social condition that will make them primary agents of a worldwide social revolution. So it's not just because they're Israel, literally, their social condition puts them in a place that they will be looked upon to lead the social revolution. And um, so that's what we, we begin to look at. So if you have any questions as we begin to close, feel free and God willing, um, we will be entering into another study next week. But today, I would like to begin with, um, what we started off with in Professor Allen Godby's uh, writings and um, since we're taking our journey to the Americas today, we decided to go east and um, and going east, we, we went all the way to China, the Tartary region. But now I would like to go into the, uh, if you will, cross the Atlantic.
Um, and it's various slides I would like to show. Um, we have left the Tartary, Tartary region, which is China, Russia. We looked at some relic, relics of um, um, the Negroes in India. We also look at some tribe Negro, so-called people with Negro features in Russia and in India. And um, so we came to this part here. Um, thousands of Negro Jews were shipped to the Americas by way of African slavery. According to Professor Alan Godby, thousands of black Jews arrived in the Americas by way of the transatlantic slave trade, the Lost Tribes of Men. And that will be found on page 246. We're going to read it. We're going to read page 246. And um, since we're going to enter into the Americas, we're going to look at a few things, and I want to revisit some of the areas that were well, just uh, two other captions or um, passages in Alan's Godaby uh, book concerning the Africans or the African Jews because of some of the uh, relics and things that they found over here in America. And so I just want to put an identity to that. But before we get there on page 246, Lost Tribes of Myth, under the chapter Berber, Moorish, and Negro Jews, Uh, again, we read it before, but I just want to read it again for the record. It says, these facts have a peculiar significance. What facts? The facts that they have found Negro Jews from Egypt to uh, Gambia, Timbuktu, Algeria, Libya, all of the North Africa. And they had migrated also. We didn't get into it in depth, but they began to migrate throughout all of Africa. And I had mentioned uh, in Zimbabwe, um, what else is it to? Uh-oh. So, I, again, I mentioned Zimbabwe, South Africa, stuff like that. But it says, uh, these facts are peculiar. These facts have a peculiar significance when the presence of Judaism among, Afri among American Negroes is to be considered. So the Jews in Africa, West Coast of Africa, you got to take into consideration this uh, strain of Yahwism or Judaism I, rep I prefer Yahwism because when you say Judaism, it can lead off to the religion idea. But the lost Israelites here in America. God, be, he continues on um, page 246. Hundreds of thousands of slaves were brought to America from this Western Africa during the days of the traffic, beginning nearly 400 years ago. How much more of Judaism? survived amongst West African Negroes in that earlier time. As persecuted communities, they were rather more in danger than other Negroes of being raided by war parties and sold as slaves. It may be considered certain that many partially Judaized Negroes were among the slaves brought to America. So, you know, again, when you're writing during this time, you know, of course, not full, but they can't, <clears throat> he don't want to say fully, so at least he would say partially Judaized. Uh, but 
we know according to the scriptures that the children of Israel were to be led off into every nation under the sun. So we know they're here according to the scripture. We just wanted to get some identification from so-called scholars. Now, with that being said, one text that I would like to look into today is a text entitled The African Presence in Ancient America. They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. They Came Before Columbus, Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. So we're going to look at some of the things he wrote. Um, do with that page 240. Six and um, I'm on at page 223 here. Now, before we delve into Ivan Van Sertima, in fact, I'll start with him first and then we'll look into lost tribes. And if you have your Bibles, get your Bibles out. One of our first texts we're going to read is Deuteronomy 28 again. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Deuteronomy 28. Well, in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 4. Now, on page 1, or chapter 1, I should say, Ivan Van Sertema, I'm not, I'm not going to get deep into it because here he's just talking about the African presence. Uh, but I want to show you a little bit on where these Africans are, were coming from. In fact, his book goes to show that African presence in America preceded Columbus by centuries. Um, and we're going to look at some of the um, evidence that shows that the African America, African Americans, so called, or the Africans from Africa inhabited the Americas, you know. Um, as early, I believe, as some of the record is 200 and 300 BC. But our introduction in chapter one, the secret route from Guinea. Now, to identify, to, so you can understand what we're looking at, Guinea. I'm going to go to slide uh, 30. Slide 30. Guinea. In fact, let me show you this slide first. Then we're going to go back to Guinea. Well, we're going to Guinea. But first, um, I want to show you this. Now, this is the west coast of Africa. And what we have here, Guinea, which is the Gold Coast, Grain Coast, Slave Coast, this is an old African map of, you see, Negro land. Now, if you notice here in the Zara or Sahara Desert, we establish that uh, the children of Israel inhabited this place. You see this place, Tambuk, from my understanding, this is Timbuktu. And so you have Algeria, Mali, all of this here. We have here Senegal or Senegal. But you notice all this is Guinea. Okay. And this is the Gold Coast. We and what else is Guinea? What else do we know about Guinea? Guinea is also the place of the Dahomey. I want to show you that again. When we're talking about the Dahomey land. This is Negro land, but let me, just a minute. This is not the map I want to show, but it's in this area. This is it. Now, this is the area we're looking at. All This was, sent, um, what did I say? Guinea. Mm -hmm. But here they call it Dahomey, the land of the Dahomey. So, and then over here, we're going to have Senegal and stuff like that. But note, I just want you to get an area of what we're looking at. 
And we established that the children of Israel were led from the West Coast. Hundreds and thousands of them were there. And let's go back to our other map. Guinea, Gold Coast. This is the land of the Dahomey, the Mandingo, all in this area, this, this Negro land, okay? Uh, we have Gambia here and um, Mali, yes. In fact, Senegal, it was another one here, but we look at other maps to get it as we read it. So th this is what we're looking at, okay? Now, we're quoting from, this is Ivan Van Sertema. He is, raise hand. Mm, he had a question, unless it's, how do I do that now? Brother Hashim. Go ahead, okay. Brother Hashim, you, you, want, yeah, you have a question, you can unmute your mic. If you have a question. Peace, what's good, Brother Judah? You you have a you said click on it. Mm -hmm. You can lower hand. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You have a question. Yes, sir. Can you uh confirm a fourteen ninety two expulsion of Jews from Timbuktu the same year that they were expelled from Spain? Can I confirm it? Yes, I've read that before. I know that they have the uh, Alhambra decree where they were expelled from Spain, but I've also yeah. read that they were expelled from Timbuktu in that same year in 1492. Oh, uh, yes, I had, I did read it before. In fact, I believe I read it from um, from Babylon to Timbuktu, I believe. But I don't have any evidence with me today to. Um, confirm it but i remember reading it and uh but i have to go back and look at the exact dates so i don't have anything to um um solidify it at the moment no proof what is he making reference to the uh the of israelites. The, yeah the israelites out of timbuktu and the same year they was taken uh expelled out of spain i know they was expelled out of spain as well Hmm. Uh, I just, I just don't have the, I don't remember the dates clearly. So, um, God willing. Okay, I, thank you. I just remember reading it. Yeah, I remember reading that too. I want to say I read it from, uh, um, from Babylon to Timbuktu by, uh, um, the author is, what's the brother, elder name? Rudolph Windsor. Rudolph Windsor. Yeah, he was at the conventions and everything. Yeah, Rudolph Windsor. Yes. Thank you. Um, here we'll be reading a text from Christopher Columbus, the journal Nova Racolta, Colombian, Colombiana. Christopher Columbus, the journal N U O V A, Nova. R A C C O L T A Colombian Colombiana Now this is part 1 of volume 1 This passage in uh they came before Columbus And so what he brings to our to our attention he says and he Columbus cuz these were Columbus journals wanted to find out what the Indians of Hispaniola had told him that there had come to it, or Hispaniola, from the south and southeast Negro people who brought those spear points made of metal, which they call guanin. G-U-A-N-I-N, G-U-A-N-I-N. Spearheads met, uh, spearhead points made of a metal which they call guanin, of which he had sent to the king and queen for a saying, and which was found to have 32 parts, the metal had 32 parts, 18 of gold, six of silver and eight of copper. 
Now, this is from Fred, Frederick Pohl, P-O-H-L. Uh, Amerigo Vespucci, pilot major. It reads, African guanis were alloys of gold. Now, they call guanin, which was this metal. So he's saying African guanis were alloys of gold containing copper for the sake of its odor. For it seems that the Negroes like to smell their wealth. The guanis brought home by Columbus were assayed in Spain and were found to contain the same ratio of alloy as those in African Guinea. Mm. So when, in other words, so when Christopher Columbus made it to the shores of America, as he was in search of for gold, some of these natives or indigenous people had encountered Negroes. In fact, uh, if you read further in the book, they were actually at war. And uh, in the book, I don't think I'm gonna read it tonight, but some of the Indians, uh, when the explorers came, they seen Negro captives. And they said, well, where they come from? They talk about these Negroes over in the hills and the mountains up in the other side of the country. They have been to war. But nevertheless, they were known for this gold alloy or this alloy of gold, copper, gold, and silver. And it is the same mixture that comes from Guinea or what the Gold Coast, the Slave Coast, or the land of the Dahomey. Okay. Now, that's page one. I would like to go into page 13. Let me go back a little bit here. So that's Guinea. Now you got the idea of the old map of Guinea. Christopher Columbus come over here. And I remember reading as well that, uh, that um, the When you look at some of the slave catcher newspapers, that's not what I want to write now, but um, this is actually a stone they found in North America. I, I, I brought this to associate what we have here, trying to put all these clues together. This is a stone relic of the ancient Hebrew uh, Decalogue or the Ten Commandments in Central America. Okay, where you're going to find these Negroes, the Negro heads, and all this other stuff we're going to look at this evening briefly. And the Lost Lunis inscription is an abridged version of the Decalogue or Ten Commandments carved into the flat face of a large boulder resting on the side of Hidden Mountain near Lost Lunis, New Mexico. So, <clears throat> Now, trying to piece this together, I want to go to a better map. Now, you have Negroes that Columbus ran into. And here is the air where going to be making reference to from Mexico down to Panama and, uh, you know, here in, in uh, South America. So Central and South America. Okay. Um, even what we have here are other relics of Negroes, tribesmen in the America. Now, they were already here. And like I said, I remember looking at some slave sheets and they would specify Negroes or Negroes from Guinea. And um, one reason why they would do that, I was told, now I don't know how valid it is, is because they had to make a, they knew it was two manner of, of Negroes here. They knew that they had brought slaves here and they also knew that there was Negroes already here. So to identify the Negroes from Africa, they will say, you will read the slave caption, Negro or Guinea, Negroes from Guinea, wanted or sold. 
This was to make the distinction from the indigenous Negroes that was already all over the place here in the land. And here's another, some uh, photos of some of the Negroes here in America. These are photos of ancient, of so-called Negro tribesmen in America. Um, I want to go to page two third. I mean, page thirteen. Now, what we have here, uh, page thirteen, the secret route from Guinea. The secret route from Guinea, and again, I did. I said I wanted to go to the map of modern day Guinea. So we've seen the old map of Guinea, and I want to go to map thirty. Slide 30. And here, so when we're looking at Guinea, what are we looking at? We're looking at Togo, Benin, Ghana, um, Burkina Faso. The Coast. Yeah, the Ivory Coast. What is Cote? The Ovary. The Ovary. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so that's French, huh? Now you see Guinea's just a little small area here. But first it was all of that. This was all the Negro land. So if you're looking at the Negro land, we're looking at Mali, Niger, Mauritania, Senegal, Guinea. Now remember all this was the Negro land. Mm -hmm. We say, yep, Sierra Leone, the Gambia coast. I want you to know, notice and keep that in mind. All right, yes, Sierra Leone down here. So again, this is, I'm gonna go back to it, but so you can see it, what we're looking at as you can see, modern map, this is the Negro land. See, this is the Negro land, all of the territories we've been looking at. All right, you go up higher, we're going to be hitting Mali, Algeria, all of this as we move north. Okay. It reads on page 13. Columbus' mission will not be complete, they said, until these continental lands have been discovered, speaking of the West, and brought under the banner of Spain. Thus, the scene was set for the exploration of the route the African mariners had taken to the New World. Columbus sailed with six ships on May 30th, 19, I mean 1498. He issued instructions to three of them to proceed to Espanola. Espanola, excuse me. To proceed to Espanola directly while he ordered the course laid to the way of the Southwest, which is the route leading from these islands to the South, because then he would be on a parallel with the lands of Sierra Leone. That would be down here. Let me go to the modern map now so we get a, back to map 30. So he's trying to arrange his flight or his trip. And so he want to go down here to Sierra Leone or be on that pattern of Sierra Leone. And now I, I want to show you how it looks like as he began to travel what it would look like traveling across the Atlantic. So you can see my map here. So he want to come down here where my arrow is. Okay, so from Spain, he want to travel, go down south, east. So he want to take this route southeast down the Sierra Leone area and begin to travel across to, as you can see, would be Central America and South America. He ordered, he ordered the course laid to the way of the Southwest, excuse me, Southwest, excuse me, I said Southeast, this would be Southwest, I'm sorry, which is the route leading from these islands, these islands to the South, because then he would be on a parallel with the islands or with the lands of Sierra, Sierra of Loa or Sierra Leone and the Cape of Santa Anne and Guinea, which is below the uh, equi 
equinoctial, which is below the equinoctial line. And after that, he would navigate to the west. From there, would go to this Espinola, in which route he would prove the theory of King Don Juan. And that he thought to investigate the report Columbus wanted to investigate the report of the Indians of Espanola who said that there had come to Espanola from the south and southeast a black people who have the top of their spears made of a metal which they call guanin. And that is the metal that they have found here in West Africa or the Ivory Coast or Guinea. The journey by that route proved to be swift and the seas calm, but it suited the Africans far more than the Europeans. So what he's beginning to explain is that the children or the Negro, and we know uh, they were here, the children of Israel were here. And by them being scattered, that's not to say that they all was under ball and chain. They was persecuted. In fact, even if you say it was Mandingo tribesmen, native men of Ham or whatever, is whether the Israelites themselves were seafarers or whether they were even taken as servants on board ships to go over to America. The fact remain is that the territory in which they're finding the African, the uh, so-called descendants, or should I say the fathers of the African-Americans here on the Gold Coast, the facts are is that they had come over here before Columbus and they had began to be shipped over here during the transatlantic slave trade. These two examples prove that the Negro, so-called Negro, would have populated the Americas abundantly uh, from both of these, uh, should I say, um, expeditions or tr uh, travels mm -hmm. from the East, Columbus and even before Columbus. Now, that was page 13, page 13. And, um, On, uh, let me see here. I don't want to read a whole lot out of there. I believe I want page 26 or no, page 19. I go to page 19 first. Now, page 19 is chapter two begin to go a little bit more and we see this is uh we have the stone here in south america we have the negroes entering to south america we have also evidence that there were israelites among these tribes and peoples from africa who traveled to south america so we're trying to put these clues together. And these are some of the uh, tribesmen and natives who were in the Americas when Columbus came or they were here before Columbus. And we're gonna show you some more evidence. Page 19. This is from Alexander von Alexander von Wuthenu or Wuthenu Wuthenu W U T H E N A U W U T H E N A U uh, This is taken from the art of terracotta pottery in the pre-Columbian South and Central Americas
Yes, that will actually be on page. I was looking for this. Make sure I got it down here. Um, because it is a platelet that I want to show you tonight. Anyone ever hear of a uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl? Quetzalcoatl? Or Quetzalcoatl? Um, I've heard of it. Well, actually, I've, I've first ran across it, I believe, reading this book. And we got this book some years back. This was the God in which a lot of the Aztecs and uh, indigenous, so-called indigenous people of South and Central America was worshiping. And Ivan Van Sertima brings together that Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl was actually a Negro deity. Um, I, I figure I put that in there because uh, I, I may read him a little bit or they're going to mention him. So I just wanted to bring that out if we do mention him. All right. Now, this is what it says. The Visible Witnesses, Chapter 2. It is in contradiction to the most elementary logic and to all artistic experience that an Indian could depict in a masterly way, the head of a Negro without missing a single racial characteristic. This is from Alexander Von Wuthaneu or Wuthaneu. He's arguing it's, 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 it's a contradiction to most elementary logic and to all artistic experience that an Indian could depict a master could depict in a masterly way the head of a Negro without missing a single racial characteristic, unless he had actually seen such a person. The types of people depicted must have lived in America. The Negroid element is well proven by the large Olmec stone monuments as well as the terracotta items, and therefore cannot be excluded from pre-Columbian history of the Americas. Now, what is he making reference to? He's making reference to these. These things right here. In fact, let me go to a slide that's going to show more than one. We're going to go back to these slides as a, uh, but as you can see, as we go on through, these carbon datings date back, I believe this one in particular that we're looking at, date back to about 5,000 BC. Don't think that out of range because remember Solomon had navies. It was common for, um, like I said before, the, the Negroes or, or the Europeans, they, they aren't the discoverers of ships. You know, people, you leave it to history, the first people ever had ships was the Europeans. That's not true. Now, this is what he's making reference to here. Let's step out of the way a little bit. African Negro stone relics of the ancient Americas. This is what Alexander von Wuthaneu is making reference to. The Negro element is well proven by the large Olmec stone monuments as well as the terracotta items and therefore cannot be excluded from pre-Columbian history of the Americas. Now, what was an interesting one that made me think of that if you had any clue, look at this. First, I thought it was seven and very well maybe seven, but this is the back of his head. And what he have is seven locks or six locks. Maybe the seventh one is blocked off seven locks of braids coming out of his helmet. So this would be the back of this image we see right here. And what I thought about when I seen it was old Samson, seven locks, probably get an idea of someone. That's what I thought. That's not, this isn't Samson. I'm just giving an, an example of some of the descriptions here, but you can see the features. These are old Mc features. And um, let's find out a little bit more about this. Um,
Right now, I want to go to page, that was page 19. I would like to move to page um, 21. This is an excerpt, or this is Ivan Van Sertema, and he is um, making reference to an explorer, this explorer that we're about to read about is um, Vasco Nunez de Balboa. Vasco Nunez de Balboa. We're going to um, just read a little account on him, and then we're going to get into the scriptures a little bit. Again, we just want to plank the case. We know that the Israelites are here. Uh, I just wanted to sh just add more to this mystery here. They are here. And the question is, are some of these people, are, are these some of these Israelites who made it here? They all came on ships, but they didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily slave ships. He said, I'm going to scatter you throughout the countries. That doesn't necessarily mean that every bit and every one of you will come on slave ships. Okay. Now what it reads here, it says, inspired by this discovery of the Southern Sea, Balboa, which is Vasco Nunez de Balboa, and his men decided to push further south. So we see they're going to start pushing further south, and I believe they're in uh, Mexico here. Uh, in fact, they, they wanted to push further south along the isth isthmus down here. Okay? Yeah. So they're moving down further south, going towards, what did they... What did they, uh, Panama area? I believe the Panama, or the Panama Canal may be up a little higher, but I, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. All right, so we understand they're in this area, okay? Under the shadow of Quarequa, they came upon an Indian settlement. Balboa came upon an Indian settlement where, to their astonishment, they found a number of war captives who were plainly and unmistakably African. Now, this has actually happened in 1513. 1513. Okay. These were tall black men of military bearing who were waging war with the natives from some settlement in the neighborhood. Balboa asked the Indians whence they, whence they got them, but they could not tell, nor did they know more than this that men of this color were living nearby and they were constantly waging war with them. These were the first Negroes that have been seen in the Indies. These were the first by uh, Vasco Nunez del Boa. Now Columbus already seen them as well in, in uh, Hispanola. So now we're going down a little bit more. So we from Hispanola now in the uh, Indies this is establishing or painting the picture for us that we got Negroes all over the place in this area, pre-Columbus. Want to go a little further? That's page 21. And this was, again, this account was in 513, uh, Christopher Columbus account was in 1498 and you see that from 1498 to 513 there are settlements of negroes in south or central and south america and even i, I mean i didn't bring the accounts but they even up in north america too in fact that if i remember correctly don't quote me on it but if i remember correctly the record of these Tribal Negroes were actually somewhere in New Mexico, extending all the way up to California, if I recall. Now, whether it was these tribesmen, I can't remember, but I do remember reading an account of the indigenous Negro population. And it shouldn't be far-fetched. In fact, I want to say it was these men from Mexico, even going up into California. 
but I don't remember. So you can always check fact it and look it up on your own and see what you can find. Now I would like to go to page um, 25 in the same work. Page 25. Now they mention of Negro skeletons and everything else that was being discovered here in the Americas. But I want to go down a little farther. Um, a head. I want to bring this one in. A head from the post-classic period stares at us across five centuries with a lifelike power and directness in plate five. Now I was able to get this, what he's making reference to in this book. And I would like to show this to you. Plate five. And um, I believe I have that and slide, maybe slide 31. Bear with me a little bit. This is the plate he's looking at. This, this figure here. Now this is a Mandingo head. Now where is Mandingo? Well, Mandingo is in the coast of the Dahomey land where they found African Negro so-called Israelites. Now what he's saying is that this plate or this uh, artifact here, which he said five centuries old. Okay, so he's taking us back to the 1400s. This is clearly the type of African who came here in 1310. In the expeditionary fleet of Abu Bakari, the second of Mali. Now, Abu Bakari the second was a king in Mali. Now, if you notice on this other map I have here, we have shown before, this is Mali. Now, what I would like to do is to get another map. Let's go back up to, so you can see where it's at. You see Mali and Timbuktu? Remember, this is Negro land, the Mandingo. They had put these dividers here the, the European colonists, they didn't put these borders, but it was all the homie land. And at one time from Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Mali, Mauritania, this was all, remember what that was? This was all Libya. Nevertheless, this, what we see here, they saying this is our, exactly the people we seen from Abu Bakr, which was a Muslim, but was he an Israelite in, uh, in his ethnic origins, Abu Bakari II, who lived in uh, one of the uh, tribal leaders or tribal kings in Mali. So these men made a tremendous visual impression upon the uh, mixed text. Last of the great pre-Columbian potters, for this is one of their finest clay sculptures. He's still making reference to this here, this sculpture here. It was found in Oaxa, Oaxaca in Mexico. So this sculpture was found in Mexico, pretty much where I argue that the uh, Where the other tribesmen that um, here, because I, I I know they were traveling from Mexico to uh, California. Now here here in Mexico, this is where they found the sculpture of that Mandingo head. Its realism is striking. No detail is vague, crudely wrought, or uncertain. So again, that's what we're looking at, slide 31. 
So they went up in Mexico. This is where, they, oh, excuse me, that's where they found it in Mexico. But let's go back up to this slide he's describing. This um, artifact or this sculpture that he found. And again, why am I going through this to show you, trying to make some math, trying to make these connections of where the children of Israel were and are and how that their presence in America preceded Columbus. So when you're finding artifacts or when you're finding stones with the Ten Commandments written in them, then you can start putting pieces together. You can start, so therefore, if you say that the children of Israel are of a Negro strain, then guess what? All of the evidence still fits that they very well it is not far-fetched to understand that the children of Israel are among the so-called African-Americans. Now, again, he's saying how this sculpture is put together in great detail. No stylistic accident can account for the undisputed Negroness of the features from the full vivid lips the darkened grain of the skin, the prognathic bone formation of the cheeks, the wide nostrils, the generously fleshed nose, down to the ceremonial earring, and the cotton cap. This would be his cotton cap up here. the cotton cap of Cadamosto noted on warrior boatmen on the Gambia. Warrior boatmen on the Gambia. Now where is Gambia? It's in the Guinea or the, uh, right up here in Guinea. Gambia, right here. You see my map is right in Senegal. So remember Senegal, uh, Bamako or Bamako, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, all this Togo, Ghana, this was the uh, Guinea land. And here we have Gambia. And the Gambia boatmen had the same features. They had the same cap according to this record. Now, Gambia, now notice, he mentioned uh, the expedition of Abubakari II of Mali here. Now, I want to show you something before we go further. We just got a couple of more in Babylon. I mean, in, uh, they came before Columbus. But with that being said, I would like to go to um, the Lost Tribes of Myth by Alexander Godby. And there, I will like to um, go to page 223. Now, first of all, I just want to get as close to this Mali and this Negro land. And that is, remember, on page 223, 223, it says, uh, then there was a medieval Jewish kingdom called Camnuria or Canuria. Where was Canuria, this ancient Jewish kingdom? North of the Senegal River, reaching eastward towards Nizar Desert, with two cities called Camnuri and Nakhira. So again, the Senegal River. We have Senegal over here. And I, I want to show you something else. Bringing them in this area. Bringing them even closer. On page 225, Berber, Moorish, and Negro Jews. So we have some in the Senegal area, bringing us back to this West Coast. A Jewish uh, kingdom which they call in the Jewish kingdom, Camnuria. But it says in the Wargla or a oasis, this would be in Algeria. Let 
Wargla or a Oasis? Right here. In the Wargla Oasis in of Algeria, 350 miles from the Mediterranean, is a colony of Jews as black as Negroes, but of Jewish type, one enthusiast said. So we, I'm, I'm reading to show you, show out from Algeria, Mali, Niger. So we're looking at Abubakar II. We're learning that this is where the Negroes were, the Negroes who call, who were called Jews. Okay, I want to read another little excerpt from here. This time I want to go to. Uh, that was page two twenty three. Um, I want to read something else and I had my stuff here. I read page 216. Hold on, bear with me a moment. Maybe my other one was 226, maybe. Okay. Um, no. That's not what I'm looking for. But nevertheless, um, the idea is to show that the uh, Negroes was in this area. Algeria, Wargla, or Aces here, here from the Mediterranean, 350 miles from the Mediterranean. We have the Negroes here, and they were in Algeria, and the other record we read uh, they were found also among the uh, Senegal rivers. The Senegal River. Now, I want to go back to, uh, they came before Columbus. They came before Columbus. Um... Yes, that was the synagogue. Okay, I read that one. I got it. I got that one. I got that one. Um, okay, excuse me for that. So, because I can get into reading a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you remember from the other previous classes, you can go back, I believe it was class five. You will find that from Morocco, Algeria, Mali, all of these areas, the children of Israel or Negro Israelites were found in all of these areas, okay? Right? Mali and all of that, okay? Now, going back to, they came before Columbus. We have um, the the court tradition, page 26, the court tradition of Mali and documents in Cairo tell of an African king, Abubakar II, right here in Timbuktu, Negro land, setting out on the Atlantic in 1311. He, com he commandeered a fleet of large boats, well stocked with food and water, and embarked on and embark from the Senegambia coast, right here, Senegambia coast. The western borders of this West African empire entering the Canaries current. Now in this book from, they came before Columbus, he actually, uh, Ivan Van Sertima talks about currents that flows from Africa to, to the shores of America. If you get caught in these currents, they will actually take you to America. And there was a lot of shipwrecks from African seamen found in America. In fact, he also goes on to say in the book, he said whales and fish, just like birds, could go into currents in the air. Fish and whales can get a current and go to sleep and ride a current for hundreds of miles. You know, so this is the magnificence of what the creator do. So these seamen knew where to go. They probably understood the currents. 
and they were taking their journeys over to the Americas. Now we're almost finished with this. I, I want to close with the scriptures on um, page 26. I think that was it. Um, all right. So he said he sailed from the uh, Senegambia coast, the western borders of this West African empire, entering the Canaries of the current, a river in the middle of the sea, as the captain of a preceding fleet of which only one boat returned, described it. Neither of the two Mandingo fleets came back to Mali to tell their story. But around this same time, evidence of contact between West Africans and Mexicans appeared in the strata in America in an overwhelming combination of artifacts and cultural parallels. So they're reading the artifacts that they have date back to about this time. For example, when the Bubikari set sail. Um, it says, uh, a black haired, black bearded figure in white robes, one of the representations of Quato or Quato, Quatzo, excuse me, Quatzo Coto, modeled on a dark skinned outsider, appears in paintings in the Valley of Mexico. So what they're trying to say here, maybe this idea of Quetzalcoatl, the way that they have him attired is the same way that Abubakari seamen would have been traveling in white, either linen or, or, or dark skin with their spears of gold. I mean, if you continue to read it, that's actually what they ran into. And they begin to be called the men from the east, from the land of the sun. And that's what Quetzalcoatl or Quetzalcoatl is supposed to be the burnt god from the east and the land of the sun, according to those in the Western Hemisphere, would have been calling the ship uh, or the seafarers traveling in that area. So I'm going to this again to show you that um, we have the Negro presence in America before Columbus, okay? So I just wanted to read some of those accounts. <clears throat> I actually go to Deuteronomy chapter um, 28 to start. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was something else that I wanted to show you all. And um, it was just to establish, I wanted to read it, but I wanted to just read another account of when. They, they were explaining the Negro presence. Oh, yes. In fact, I was supposed to read it first. I'm thinking it was the first one I read, but this was the last account out of uh, 12 tribes or the Lost Tribes of Myth. To, to put this in perspective, this is page 216. With abundant testimony to a very long continued infusion of ancient Yahwism into North Africa, Libya, Algeria, Niger, Mali, Mauritania, all that, Chad, okay? This long continued infusion of ancient Yahwism into North Africa and a vivid picture of a primitive or degraded type of it that persisted into the Christian era. Jewish evidence of the extent of its spread should be considered. Philo of Alexandria tells of, tells of Agrippa's appeal to the crazy Caligula in behalf of the Jews outraged in Alexandria. And this is the part, knowing that the city Alexandria, the city Alexandria had two classes of inhabitants, our, our, our own nation and the people of the land and that the whole of Egypt was inhabited in the same manner and at the and that the Jews who inhabited Alexandria and the rest of the country from Catabathmos on to the side of Libya to the boundaries of Ethiopia were no less than one million men. So he's speaking all, pretty much all of this North Africa 
Shore, Emil Shore, which was a theologian, long ago wrote that the ancient Judaism was already traceable by its inscriptions from the Egyptian frontier westward. So from Egypt westward now. These are European Emil front, uh, Shore. Westward, bringing us back to this West Coast. It sure long ago wrote that the ancient Judaism or Yahwism was already traceable by its inscriptions from the Egyptian frontier westward through Libya, clear across North Africa to the extreme west of Mor Mauritania, right here. Bringing us back to Senegal, to the West Coast, taking us all into the land of Abu Bakari II, the, the, uh, the, what we've been looking at, the Mandingo tribesmen, and all of that, taking us right back there, right? As far west as Mauritania, as far as Volubilis. And that's somewhere in here too. I, I got another map, but I'm not gonna go into it. But it's right up here in the Algeria, Mauritania area, if I'm not mistaken. Jerome in his letter to Dardani Dardanus wrote that the Jews in his time about 400 AD were spread from the extreme west of Mauritania Morocco to India, and that they did not speak Hebrew, which suggests that local proselytes were the main body of the Jews he wrote of. He claimed that they're proselytes, but we know that they Jews. So we talk about Mauritania and Morocco. So we got this all of this West Coast. We got them in Senegal, Guinea. Okay. And they spread all the way back to India. And we went, we, we took that route first. So y'all all with me on that? Now, this were the children of Israel. We pretty much try to establish all over the globe. Uh, they were in Spain. One of the uh, comrades talked about this earlier, about the exposure of the Jews in Spain. Um, and Timbuktu, which I do remember reading that. We know they were in Italy. We know from the book of Acts that they were all over Europe. We, we touched on that. So as the Bible says, now if I, what did I ask you to go to? Deuteronomy chapter 28. Just read two verses. Deuteronomy 28, starting at verse 25. Deuteronomy 28, starting at verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. You shall be smitten before your enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them uh -huh. and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. You shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. That's what we've been reading. We've been traveling through all, all of the earth and we're seeing that's what the children of Israel are. And we winding up back here in the Negro land of Guinea, West Africa. And we taking our journeys back across to America. And we see that you will be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. When you finish verse 25, read verse 36. Okay, verse 36. Yes. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. Uh -huh. And there shall thou serve other gods, wood and stone. There you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall be led off and scattered into all the kingdoms. So we could probably say, since from the records of these um, uh, scholars, Truly, no matter if people see, see this, this gets into this thing of whether the Israelites are real and all this other stuff. We, we have native tribesmen, pre-Christian era, talking about the tribes of Manasseh in India, talking about the, I mean, these are the records themselves, they, the tribesmen themselves, saying our fathers are of Manasseh and Ephraim, and we have come from Jerusalem 13 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. This is readily known. This is, you know, this is something that really can't be disputed, really. Okay, some of them didn't even have the entire Bible. Some of them just had the Torah. Mm -hmm. Right? So therefore, this idea of Israel conspiracy, well, you got to go into the go into these tribes and into, into these villages and find out, well, how did they come to this conclusion? Okay, and because they were fragmented, some had the Torah, some didn't. Some, I mean, they all pretty much had the Torah, the Pentateuch, but some didn't have the Book of Maccabees because they didn't know about the, uh, you know, they 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 left before the Greek 
captivity. So we're talking about them being all over the world, all over the globe, just like the Bible say. And I'm not here to tease nobody and everything, but, but again, this is what I mean by research. You know, if you get into this 12 tribe chart thing, you're going to find difficulties. But when you really start to look into some, and there's much more to learn, I'm sure this is just touching the surface, that, you know, you can prove this stuff to be true if we do a diligent search. Now, did you finish verse 36? Yes. Would you read it again for me? The Lord shall bring thee, and thy king which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. With a nation which thou nor thy fathers have known. We finished 36. That's good. That's all I want. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You're going to serve, you're going to be let off into another country, a country in which your fathers have not known. And there you shall serve gods, wood and stone. Right? Mm -hmm. and he says and uh, you have read verse 23 and he said in verse 23 um, of Deuteronomy I'm sorry you read verse 25 of Deuteronomy yes. it said he shall call thee to be smitten before your enemies and thou shall go one way out against them and flee seven ways and thou shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth and we've been establishing that now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4 Deuteronomy chapter 4 let me look at my time Deuteronomy chapter 4. And when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 4, I can read if you want. It's up to you. Start at verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you and make you a graven image now you know now y'all remember now all of you who've been attending the classes we got to remember the importance of this covenant this covenant is for the children of israel to raise up a egalitarian society they are to bring a forth a social revolution in the globe because of the covenant he made with abraham he made another covenant with them giving them the law of sinai that they must go forward with the mission if anything was to happen that they have forsaken the covenant, it was going to be big problems. And so he's saying again, it was that verse 23 you had read? I'm in the middle of 23. He said, take heed to yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. Yes. Now continue. Take heed. Take diligent heed or else it's going to be problems. Go ahead. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. When thou shalt beget children and ch and children's children, yes, and ye shall have remain long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. Uh -huh. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. And this may be evidence and proofs of this people being shipped from the west coast of Africa and themselves traveling across to the Americas. Traveling across to the Americas. Now, there's a little evidence here. These stone hedges, the stones crying out, the stone mm -hmm. hedges are crying out that this very well may be this people or the people of Israel travel with these people. But why I'm bringing this out, because this evidence that we see of these stone hedges, they're literally coming from evidence showing they're coming from the place where the children of Israel populated abundantly in Africa. You understand what I'm trying to say here? Mm -hmm. Many Jews were found in North, Af North and West Africa. With that in mind, either Van Sertima writes of West Africans frequenting the Americas centuries before Columbus, and they came before Columbus. Jews in the Americas even before Columbus. All right. Now go ahead and continue to read that because he said, "This one I'm gonna send you to all over." And ye shall not prolong your days upon it, uh -huh. but shall utterly be destroyed. 
Yes. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. Yes. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, uh -huh. whither the Lord shall lead you. Yes. And there ye shall serve God, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. Uh huh. But if thou from thence, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Yes. And thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. See, this probably explains. So when you look at the Aztecs and the Mexicans and the Negro element among them and them worshiping different gods and all that other stuff, this is what he's explaining. You're going to be worshiping other gods. So Abu Bakari II probably was a Muslim. You understand? They probably did pick up different superstitions. But we understand that the children of Israel, they must be in every nation under the sun. And we're showing these Negro element as well in every nation under the sun. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Verse 30. Then thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even the latter days. You see that? When thou art in tribulation in the latter days, that means you're supposed to be in tribulation, even in the latter days. Mm -hmm. I want to read something to you. While you hold your marker there, I want to read something to you. This will be out of the book of Luke. We had read it earlier, but I want to show you the compliment with our sisters reading here. I want to read uh, Luke chapter 21, Luke the 21st chapter. And, 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 and this, um, we're going to get this from the Messiah. Actually, I got it on one of the slides, but I won't worry about that tonight. Luke chapter 21, verse 21. It reads, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereto, or thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress. Matthew said great tribulation. Distress and tribulation is one and the same. There should be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Just like we're reading in Deuteronomy. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay? Now, nevertheless, brothers and sisters, he shall deliver us from the country. We're going to close with that. Now, let's finish where you were. So you're going to be led to captivity into every nation under the sun. I need to start verse 30 over again. Okay, yes. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, yes. even in the latter days, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, if you turn and be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, yes, he is, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy father, you see that, which he swear unto them. He said he, he won't forget the covenant, the covenant he made with Abraham. Why? Because Abraham's children must be a blessing to the nations. And the object, one of the objectives of this school is to show or to build a case what that looks like, the blessing to the nations. Social revolution, to raise up a global worldwide egalitarian society, which is a society of justice and equity. Then all nations of the earth will be blessed. Because he remembered a promise made unto the fathers, Israel will not get out of this job. If you refuse to do it, you will perish. If you yield to the will of God, you will prosper. And in your prosperity, you shall bring everlasting justice and peace to the earth. These are the choices. Okay? So notice. Just read that. Because what verse you at now? You should be I somewhere. finished 30. Yes, read verse, 31, I'm sorry. read verse 31 again, because that's as far as I want you to go. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He's a merciful God. And he will not forsake thee, uh -huh. neither destroy thee, No, he will nor not. forget the covenant of thy fathers, he which he swear unto them. He won't forget it. Go ahead. For ask now of the days that, that are past. Well, you finished with that that's, 31? Yes. We good. Okay. He will not forget it. 
Now, if you will, brothers and sisters, let's bring a little bright side to this before we close. Let's go to Jeremiah 23rd chapter. And we got three texts after this. Jeremiah the 23rd chapter. And we um, there's some things I want to show you. Um, while you're turning there, to put this in perspective, what we had read in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, what we had read, it followed with this. In Luke 21, see, um, after he said, verse 24, he said, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of, of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Then he says, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars. This is verse 25. Mm -hmm. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and wave roaring. That's what we see happening. Distress of nations. And we could begin to understand why this global network going to bring a global tyranny and oppression throughout the world. We see it, we've been seeing it uh, formulate uh, over the past, even since this country been developing. Birth of the technological age and everything else. So this thing is going forward, just like he said, everything going according to plan. Verse 26, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I mean, great perplexity in earth. Governments, nation against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, war, everything, trouble. Our only hope is the God of Israel. And we got to understand what that means. And what caused all this unrest? Injustice. That's what caused it all. And I don't want people to forget this. This isn't superstition. This is injustice among men and have cause a great schism in mankind. Amen. Nevertheless, the creator says, the heavens or for the powers of heaven shall be shaken in verse 26. And then shall they see the son of man coming in the cloud of power and great glory. This is, I argue, apocalyptic imagery. The writer is deriving this language from the prophets. Whenever God come to do judgment, he was known to ride upon the clouds, ride upon the cherubim. It may be a mistake to take this literally signifying a man will come in the clouds. This same language, the creator always come with the clouds to do judgment in the prophets. Okay. When this judgment and this unrest, be, when, when this unrest happens, then judgment will come signified by the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. Verse 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, this unrest, global unrest, when these things begin to come to pass, then lift up or then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Come close to being redeemed. To do what? Now, Let's go to that Jeremiah. I should go to Jeremiah 23rd chapter. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't mind, would you start at verse 1? <clears throat> Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, uh -huh. saith the Lord. Now, when he say pastors here, brothers and sisters, he's not, or, 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 he's not talking about preachers on the corner. Shepherds and pastors are political leaders in the Bible. Cyrus was called the shepherd or a, a, a pastor. Political leaders in the Bible, that's what they're called, shepherds and pastors. Mm -hmm. Not what theology have taught us today. All right. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, yes. against the pastors that feed my people, uh -huh. ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now we learn in another element of the Israelite scattering, not just in slave ships, but even the unjust pastors have driven them away. So we understand why Israel, when you read, some Israelites was leaving in the days of Jeroboam. Some Israelites was leaving in the days of Rehoboam because of Rehoboam oppression and a divide in the civil war. So Israel was scattering, not just because of captivity, because of the injustices and the continual error of the leaders who have ruled over them. So he have caused them to err and he have 
scattered them. The leaders continue. Verse three. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them. Yes. And will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Yes. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Why not? Because what's happening now is a total renovation and a social a, a revolution. Why won't you be lacking? Because you're going to have leaders that's going to feed you. You're going to have leaders that's going to have equal distribution of wealth and resources. This is a global renovation. It's not hocus pocus. This is a total change in the governmental structures. The old governmental structures and institutions will be abolished and new ones will rise up that will bring justice to the world. And he's saying none will be lacking, reminiscent of Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, reminiscent of what Miriam said, he's going to send the mighty away empty and fill the lowly of the, or the poor with good things. Amen. Continue. Verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will... I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper yes. and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. You see why you won't be hungry no more? Because justice and judgment will not just reign on the little coast of Israel and the Levant and the Mediterranean. It shall be justice and judgment in the earth. Continue. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Remember what the master said, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. And Israel shall dwell safely. Yes. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. The Lord or Yehoah our justice. Because remember, the habitation of his throne is the habitation of justice. Amen. Now let's just investigate just briefly how this is going to look. We've done in Jeremiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60. And we want to close this out with uh, Jer uh, we're going to make this comparison with Isaiah 60 and Revelation briefly. We're not going to read the entire chapter. Um, we're just going to, um, so we got these three, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 2, and Revelation. Okay, so first let's start off in Isaiah chapter 60, starting at verse 1. When you get it, if you don't mind, would you start reading that for me? Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Then he say, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. Mm -hmm. He got to remember the promise is made. See, this isn't over. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Ignorance and, and darkness will cover the earth. Go ahead. And gross darkness the people. Yes. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. Uh -huh. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. His glory shall be seen where? Upon you. You won't see nobody sitting in the chair nowhere. Mm. You're going to see the glory of God upon people. Why? Because a time is now coming when justice and judgment is going to be executed in the earth. All right, let's continue. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and, the, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Wait a minute. The nations shall come to your light, and the world rulers shall come to the brightness of thy rising. At least the ones that's smart. They're going to come to the brightness of your rising, your uprising, the Israel uprising. Why are they uprising? Social revolution. Notice carefully. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy son shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Remember what Jeremiah said? He should gather. Wait a minute. Hold your marker there, because we didn't finish. Mm -hmm. That Jeremiah 23? No, I know, but it was something in Jeremiah 23 I didn't want you to leave out. Okay. Let's go back there, because he said, lift up. He said, uh, uh, then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. We're going to look at that verse 5 again, but that Jeremiah 23 and you actually had stopped in verse, if I'm not mistaken, verse uh, five. 
Did you stop in verse five? Shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Yes. Um, Judas shall be saved. Lord, I write. You read, read, read verse six. Yes. Verse seven and eight. Okay. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. This is Jeremiah chapter 23, verses seven and eight. Uh huh. That they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Uh huh. Lord, you're not going to remember that now. That was a big thing, but guess what? Something bigger happening. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel uh -huh. out of the north country. Wait a minute now. Uh huh. And from all countries whither I had driven them. That's right. And they shall dwell in their own land. Mine heart within me is broken. That's good. Okay. He said it won't be remembered no more. How it was when he brought them out of that little territory land of Egypt. What's happening now? We have read the children of Israel and spread from Russia, China, India, all over the globe, United States, Canada, Africa. And now, let's go back to the Isaiah 60. What's going to be, what's taking place now? A global, a pan revolution. All right, now. And remember, it's important for us to know this. This isn't talking about Israel coming back together and all this happening so they could practice their religion. You've got to remember why all of this is happening. The promise made to Abraham to bring justice and judgment into, into this earth. If we don't understand that, then we don't even understand what this is all about. Genesis laid the foundation for us. Now let's start at, again at that Isaiah 60 and verse 5. Okay. Isaiah 60 and 5. Then thou shalt see and flow together. Yes. And thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. Yes. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Anybody know what the forces of the Gentiles mean? Not a military force. Mm -mm, not a, well, you can include the military force, but this specifies, if you look it up, if you have a note in your Bible, wealth. The wealth of the remember why Israel got to get the wealth because they must redistribute the wealth and equity. The wealth of the nations shall come unto thee. Shall come unto thee. Go ahead. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Epha and Epha, all they from Sheba shall come, and they shall bring gold and incense and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Now, I want you to understand this poetic or this imagery that Isaiah is bringing to the table. He's saying that the wealth of the nation shall come unto thee. Do you know exactly who this is? We would say, well, this is Israel. That is true. But you know what the elders and the apostles describe Israel as? The temple of Yah, does it? The tabernacle of God or the house of God and we're these building blocks. So look at this, look at the imagery. The wealth of the nations are being is being taken to where? The temple of God. Mm. Where he dwells in the midst of his people, which signifies him dwelling in the midst. He only can dwell in the midst of them if there is justice there. So we have justice in the temple of God and the nations bringing their gifts, just like Israel brought their gifts to the temple and to the tabernacle. Hold your market in, let's go to Isaiah, because we're going right back to this. I just want to show you Isaiah chapter two. Isaiah chapter two. And I want you to understand this imagery as we read through. We're not going to read the entire Isaiah 60. We're just going to, we're going to skip, but I want to show you what's happening. The, the wealth of the nations coming to the children of Israel, that's, they're going to be gathered. And that's where they add in all the nations too. Isn't, it, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. When they left Egypt because of captivity, they left with wealth. Now they're going to possess the wealth again. Why? Why? Because the wealth of the nations was made off of who? The children of Israel. The children of Israel. This was the yeah. Bolsheviks were arguing because of their social composition. Their social condition, the wealth of the nation was made off of their super exploitation. And not just Israel, of course, but they were the super exploited. So the wealth will be redistributed to those who earn the wealth. 
Isaiah chapter two. Let's understand what's going on here. Isaiah two, we already realized what Jeremiah talked about. They shall be gathered from north, south, east, west. He gonna gather shepherds who shall execute justice and judgment. Feed his flock where they not where they will not be lacking. That means they will have an administration, a governmental administration that will feed the people. None will be lacking. Now notice what Isaiah chapter two verse one says. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Yes. And it shall come to pass in the last days uh -huh. that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. You see what's being established in Isaiah 60? The Lord's house is being established because these children of Israel and all those who join themselves to Israel, they are the Lord's house, according to the apostles. They are the temple of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the Lord's house is being established in the top of the governments. Mm -hmm. And what's happening? And shall be exalted above the hills. Yes. And all nations shall flow unto it. Are the nations flowing unto the house of the Lord empty? No, they're bringing their wealth to the house of the Lord. Just like she began to read in Isaiah, they began to bring their offerings, the animals. This was the imagery of Isaiah, this idea of all these offerings and animals going up to the house of the Lord to make petition, to make reconciliation, to make atonement. The people are bringing their gifts to the temple of God. Let's continue. Verse three. Verse three. Uh huh. And many people shall go and say. Many people shall go and say. What what, what they saying now? Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. You hear that? And He will teach us His ways. Uh huh. And we shall, and we will walk in His path. The same paths that's described in Jeremiah twenty three, where none will be lacking. The same path that's described in Psalms twenty three that lead us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Peacefully laying, peaceful, peaceably walking among the still waters, mm -hmm. among the green pastures, being led by rivers of living water. All of these descriptions, all through the prophets is showing a society of justice, peace. Everyone is, is, is taken care of. None are afraid of the enemies and tyrants and exploiters. You understand what the Bible trying to teach us? Israel, understand their mission. And everybody who's adopted into this family, you understand, you must be working for not a religion. You, We all must be working for a global transformation, a Amen. global revolution to bring peace and justice into the earth because that's the only way the nation of the earth is going to be blessed. All right, now let's just go read a little bit more out of that in the middle of three and we will walk in his paths for out of zion shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem out of zion shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem now we see where they're going they're going up to the house of the lord now let's go back to that isaiah 60. see they're going up to the house of the lord that's where they're going they're going to his house why because they heard it's a blessing there and when and what did you do when you, when you wanted a blessing, you'll bring your offerings, you'll bring your gold, and you'll bring it up to the temple. That's what they do. The temple was a prototype of it. And you stop in Isaiah 60, I believe you stopped at verse 5. In fact, you stopped at verse 6. Now notice, the wealth mm -hmm. or the forces of the Gentiles in verse 5 will be, come, will be, will, will, will be given to Israel. Mm -hmm. Now notice he's describing the wealth in verse 6. Multitudes of camels. The multitude of camels shall come over thee. Yes. I'm sorry, shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Epha. You see, uh, these are cattle. Mm -hmm. Remember, you also brought unclean animals to the temple, but the priests gave you a price for them. You didn't sacrifice them. Mm -hmm. Notice what they're bringing. They're animals. What else are they bringing? Are they bringing their gold? All they from Sheba shall come. And they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Because they're bringing it to the house of God. But who is the house of God? It is a, you. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, he says in verse 1. The glory of Yah is risen upon you. This isn't a literal city coming out of space. 
This is a redeemed people who's working to transform the earth and all the nations is taking heed. Well, not all, because some going to perish. Now, he continued to talk about verse 7. Notice this. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee, and they shall come up with acceptance on mine altar. Yes. And I will glorify the house of my glory. You see who his house is? All of the wealth of the nations is coming to the temple of the Lord, which is the people of God who will administer the laws of God, which will bring a blessing to the nations where none going to be hungry, none going to be lacking, or as Jeremiah said, none will be lacking. They're going to have shepherds that shall feed them. Shepherds that shall teach the nations. That's good. Out of verse 7, we want to skip down a little bit. Now, he said, arise and shine for thy light is come. Is that what he said? Yeah. And then when he, when, when he said, arise and shine for thy light is come, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 21. He said, arise and shine for thy light is coming. Just keep your mark in Isaiah 60, because we're going to close with these two. Arise and shine for thy light is coming. The chapter wealth of the nations coming. Isaiah chapter 60. Re Revelation I'm sorry. Chapter. Revelation chapter 21. I'm sorry. Revelation chapter 21. Mm -hmm. And let's start reading at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven... And the first earth were passed away, yes. and there was no more sea. First heaven and the first earth was passed away. In other words, he's talking about a renovation. No more heaven, no more earth, no more seas. That's what he's describing. Not that they're literally gone, but they're all being renewed. Go ahead and continue. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Notice this, the, the description of this New Jerusalem. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He only could abide in tabernacle with men because now men are being instructed in justice. Or as Isaiah 2 said, they shall come up and learn the law of the Lord. All right, let's continue. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Isaiah already explained in other passages that the people are the bride. They are the Jerusalem. The people. Isaiah explained that, but we won't get into that tonight. What else did he say? Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he and he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new uh -huh. and he said unto me right for these words are true and faithful he said i'm making all things new and write mm -hmm. this down because they true and faithful what do you what are you wiping away no more sorrow no more crying none of that Let's go back to the Isaiah 60 and let's start this time at verse 15. Arise and shine, for thy light is come. For the glory of God has risen upon thee. And here we see in Revelation 21 and 3, the tabernacle of God has made it abode among men, or the glory of God has risen upon thee. Notice this. Isaiah 60, verse 15. Yes. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hate it, so that no man went through thee. I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Yes. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles. You shall, you shall receive the wealth of the nations. And shall suck the breast of kings. Yes. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. For brass, I will bring gold, and for iron, I will bring silver. You see, this is what you brought to the temple. Gold, silver, animals, the riches of the Gentiles. This is what's being brought to you because you are the temple of God. Notice. And for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace. I will make your leaders peace. 
and thine exactors righteousness. And all your exactors will begin, all the ones who cheated you and extorted you, that will have, you're going to have pastors that's going to feed you according to Jeremiah. Your exactors now are those who rule over you shall do justice. And that justice shall produce officers of peace. We always, we look at these politics. We're dealing with politics. This is how, this is what's changing the world. The mentality and the teachings of governmental equity and justice. This is what's changing the world. Amen. Now notice what he says now. Verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Look this up in the Hebrew, violence signifying oppression and unjust gain, which came from exactors and officers who exploited you. Now your exactors or your leaders will do justice. They shall lead you in paths of peace. And so therefore unjust gain and violence shall no more be heard in thy land. That's why Revelation said, he shall wipe away the tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, neither crying for the former things are passed away. But nevertheless, let's, let's look into this a little bit more. Go ahead. I'm going to uh, start verse 18 over. Okay. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. Yes. But thou shalt call thy wall salvation and thy gates praise. You see that? Your wall yeah. shall be what? Everybody want to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at the walls of salvation. You see what we're leading to? What this is all about? You didn't know this much politics in it, did you? I didn't either in the beginning. But it started to make sense. That's what changed the world. That's what run, the politics run the world. And we've been duped to separate the God of heaven from politics. Mm -hmm. And now he's teaching us, this is a social revolution. Remember, we're reading about a social revolution. That's why Israel would call. Remember, if you rethink yourself, he said in Deuteronomy, and repent, then I will remember the land. Then I will remember the covenant made unto your fathers. And once he does that, justice shall fill the earth like the water cover the sea. And look what he's explaining. Verse 19. Verse 19. The sun shall be no more thy light by day. Yes. Neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. Yes. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. He shall be an everlasting light. And thy God, thy glory. And thy God, thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. That's right. Because the darkness will no longer fill the earth ignorance. Right now you should be illuminated. You should be enlightened. This is what he's describing. He's not talking about there will never be a sun or nothing like that. This is poetic imagery. Darkness represented ignorance and oppression. The light represents peace, justice, equity, and the good of all men. It shall never cease to be from this time forth. That's why the covenant must be made in the hearts of men. Because once it's in the consciousness, man will never turn to the paths of darkness ever again. And this is what he's describing. Your light shall no more go down, never. Your sun will never be darkened. Remember that was the imagery? Go ahead and read. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. So let's begin to close back in this Revelation chapter 21. The days of your morning shall be ended. And just starting at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 again. Your days of your mourning shall be ended. And we're going to close with this Revelation 21. The days of your mourning shall be ended. And um, yes, Revelation 21 and 4. Notice what he said. Since the days of your mourning shall be ended. Notice what John began to explain. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's right. Because your days of your mourning are ended. Uh-huh. And there shall be no more death. Go ahead. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. No. For the former things are passed away. The days of your mourning shall be ended. And what else will we read about? Let's skip down now. For the sake of time, let's skip down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Yes. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, 
descending out of heaven from God. Now I can show you in Isaiah, this isn't a real city coming out. This holy Jerusalem, Isaiah said, it is the people of Zion. You are Jerusalem, the holy Mount Zion. Amen. Isaiah said it and Paul also said it in Hebrews chapter 12. We're not talking about a little city coming down out of the sky. We're talking about a people that shall be established in the top of the mountains according to Isaiah chapter two. And notice what else he says. Verse 11, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious. Now, do y'all remember? Read that again for me. Having the glory of God. Read that Having again. the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Who? Who's having the glory of God? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, do y'all remember Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1? Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Mm -hmm. And the glory of Jehovah is risen upon thee. Mm -hmm. You are the people. You are Jerusalem. Even New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. For behold, Isaiah says, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and the glory and his glory shall be seen upon thee and the Gentiles shall go to thy light. See, the Gentiles not going to see no being sitting in a chair. What are they seeing? The glory of God upon his people. Like the Messiah said, they kept asking the Christ, would you show us the Father? Would he tell him? He said, when you see who? When you see me, you have seen a Father. Mm -hmm. When we do his will, God will be seen in us. Because mm -hmm. he will be in us and we will be in him. Stop looking for a man in a chair. We got a responsibility. Now, notice what you read again. Verse 11 again. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious. That's right. So arise and shine for the glory of God has come upon thee, Isaiah have said. Go ahead. Even like a jasper stone, yes. clear as crystal, mm -hmm. and had a wall great and high, yes. and had 12 gates, and at the gate 12 angels, and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Showing that the city is built upon the children of Israel. The entrance you must go through the, if you want to get into the walls of salvation or to be saved, you must go through Abraham's children because it is the children of Israel signified by the gates. To enter in, you got to go through Abraham's children. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's continue to read. This is the wall of the city, the walls of salvation, Isaiah called it. Verse 13, on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. Yes. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, let's skip down to verse 23. This is it. This is the hope of Israel. God willing, we'll be doing a teaching. We'll be doing a class on the book of Romans. So we could start to put more of this together to show how, what, what this is about. See, this is true love. This is true love when we love our neighbor. When we truly love our neighbor and don't do evil to our neighbor. When we provoke our neighbor to walk in righteousness. That is the true demonstration of love. And it's going to produce peace. Okay, I ask you to go where about verse to verse 23. If you don't mind, go ahead. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. Wait a minute now. The city had no need of the sun, mm -hmm. nor the moon to do what? To shine in it. Why not? For the glory of, the, of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. Now, wait a minute. Now, this city is who arise and shine for thy light is come for the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60 and verse 1. Then in Isaiah 60 verse 19, the sun shall be no, the, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither the brightness shall, neither 
for neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy God, thy glory. Verse 20 in Isaiah 60, thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. This is the exact parallel that John is drawn from back in Revelation. Just read that verse again. Verse 23. Yes. And the city had no need of the sun. That was it? Okay. Yeah, that's it. And the city had no need of the sun. See what Isaiah was describing? See what John is describing? No need of the sun. Neither of the moon. Yes. To shine in it. That's right. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. The glory of God and the lamb is the light thereof. Where is the lamb at? He's in us and we's in and we in him. The light of righteousness is shining upon the globe. And why? Now, since the light of righteousness and justice is shining upon the globe, then it shall come to pass with the book of the law say, the nation shall go to you and say, surely you are wise and understanding people. Notice what, that, notice what John says in John chapter Revelation mm -hmm. 23 and verse 24. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 21 and 24. Yeah. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Wait, the nations of them which are saved shall enter in through the gates to enter in, to enter the precincts or the walls of salvation. You see that? The nations who saved, they shall enter in to be protected by the walls of salvation. Continue. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Verse 24. Well, okay. verse 20. You could verse I'll 24. Start 24 over yes. again. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Remember, the forces of the Gentiles shall be converted unto thee. The nations shall bring their wealth, they shall bring their camels, they shall bring their gold. This is what Isaiah 60 is describing. Once the light of God is shine upon us, and when will God light shine upon us? When he said in Deuteronomy 24, when we repent. See, when we repent, repenting means it equals to change our ways to now work towards the social revolution that brings justice and egalitarianism. Y'all follow me with this one? Mm -hmm. All right, so we get ready to close, but go ahead. We're we, we going finish to it, finish it up with this. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. Uh-huh. For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Yes. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Anything that will disrupt this way of peace, equity, and justice shall not enter. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination yes. or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only they which are written in the Lamb's book, like like like, like the minister say, that precious mm. book of life. Mm. This is the hope. This is the salvation that we're waiting on. This is the blessing of the nations. It isn't our religions. It is a total transformation and renovation of the earth, the tearing down of the old institutions, the destruction of all exploiters and oppressors, and to bring in, a, 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 to get rid of all the darkness that the oppressors have brought on the globe and to usher in a new age of light, to usher in a new age of equity and peace where there's none lacking, there's none afraid, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death there. This is a time in which we're working towards. This is the incentive to get it together. But if we just taught that repentance is to practice the cultist rituals of Judaism, you won't produce this. But if we're taught that not only are the cultist practices of us keeping the Sabbath day and the feast days and our celebrations, if that is accompanied with first and foremost, the social revolution to work and to fight to bring in egalitarianism into the earth, to publish and make known to mankind to repent and teaching them what repentance mean and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. 
What do you must do to repent? Isn't that what they asked John the Baptist? Yes, John said, repent or them stones going to cry out and make a fool out of you. And then what they say, well, John, would you tell us what to do? Now, we're going to close. We're going to open up. But this is the reason Israel has been scattered all over the globe. That's why they've been scattered all over the globe. And now we're looking at they have been scattered all over the globe. But you know what? The calling of God is without repentance. Either we're going to comply or we're going to die. But if we comply and do what's right, nothing but goodness comes. That's why he asked the question, why would you die, O children of Israel? Why don't you just do what's right? It's better for you. Okay? So we're going to open up. If anyone have any questions, this will be our last class for this evening. And God willing, we will uh, resume next week with a, a new uh, discussion. Okay? This thing. Uh, the same thing. What do we have here? Some of the questions. Let's see if we give us some of the questions. You can open up your mics now. And yes, you can also open up your mics if you would like. Um, let me see. Um, oh, you're talking about the omics. Okay. Oh, let's see. Hey, Judah, real quick. This is Sean. Hey, when uh, I think it was Brother Hashem, he I brought up about the expulsion of the Jews um, mm -hmm. from uh, Spain. Spain, Spain, and Timbuktu. Yeah, uh, which we call it. I got a, you know, that book, Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, the yeah. one the Nation of Islam put together. Yeah, they got a they got a whole section where they give all the dates that they was exposed. I don't mention Timbuktu, but they mention basically from Europe. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I never read that one. But I heard it, uh, the one, I think Farrakhan did that one. Yeah, they did a good job because all these sources came from um, Jewish, so-called Jewish sources. Yeah, I heard that was a pretty good, pretty good reference. Yeah. I don't know. Can you put pictures up? Like, would I be able to send a picture? Because I actually got a digital copy of the book. If I could find that page, I could send that page with all the dates on it. You can, um, you can, he can send a file. You can upload a file on Zoom. Or if you have it on your computer, um, we can enable you to share your screen if we exit out of our screen. Yeah, because I, I don't oh. know how to do it. Are you oh, on? Don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't, don't trip out. You know, okay. he in the group, yeah, so right. eventually yeah. I'll load it up somewhere. He'll get it somehow. Okay. But if you just want them dates, I, I got, I got, uh, I can give him a copy of that picture with all the dates on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Shalom. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me just go down a little bit and see if I if people have any questions or comments. Um, let me see the Black Christ of how do you pronounce that? Esquipolis. Esquipolis is a wooden image. Es is it's a Q there. Q U I P. <laughs> Escutulous. Escutulous. Word. <laughs> you ain't lying. I'll butcher your word in a minute. Make brand new words. Say how you pronounce it again. Escupolis. Yeah, Escupolis. Escupolis is a yeah. wooden image of Christ now housed in the Cathedral Basilica of Escupolis in Escupolis, Guatemala, 222 kilometers. Or 138 miles from the city of Guatemala. It is one of the crystals. Interesting. That'd be nice to get a picture of that one too. What else we have here? Um, man, this thing moves so fast. Um, hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. There's more to it. Let's see. The image is known as black because Spanish missionaries. See, it went too far. Man, this aggravates me. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it off.
The image is known as black because Spanish missionaries wish to convert the natives who worship Ek Campula. And this is in Guatemala. And this is the area she's bringing out. Our sister's bringing out this area where we were discussing tonight. Guatemala over there in uh, uh, Central and South America area. Um, how do we get rid of the current government? Let's see. I can, I'm trying to get down to that one. Um, actually that comes with teaching. You have to begin to go on, a, you have to be educated, you have to learn and instruct others. It's a battle of ideas. And uh, most high willing, we're going to look into that even more so because the Bible constantly talk about the battle of words. So you have this, this, um, the word of God sharpening any two-edged sword. You got the, a sword coming out of the Messiah's mouth. You have text that says he shall speak peace to the nations. Everywhere you read, you find this war of ideas, this battle of words this warfare of words. And I've come to learn that's the true battle because you can go with guns, but for example, today, you see people out here rioting and everything else today, acting a fool. And who, you, who do you have among the rioters? You have those who don't give a dog on about revolution. They just exploiters themselves. So if you started, a, if you waged a war today, you can't guarantee that everybody in your army is for your cause. Some people join your cause just because you win it. So this, this idea of uh, armed warfare never worked. But when we talk about the battle of ideas, when a person is convinced and their mind or their heart is changed, that's what does it. And that truly is a miracle. Um, it says, just seems with our people still voting for president, these wicked people will remain for well, uh, again, that, that voting thing is a little bit more than what meets the eye. It's, it's really understanding politics. It's, it's a, like people say a game of chess. And uh, it, it really takes study. It's not just, uh, for example, we can't paint everybody with one brush. And I explained this before. Um, Cyrus is a perfect example. Cyrus, he let the Israelites go back. God calls Cyrus his anointed. But Cyrus also let every nation go back to serve their gods and to worship devils. So when we're looking at people put in places to help, this is when we begin to have a different perspective of how things work in his life. Okay, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, his army of the guard, after he destroyed Jerusalem, he told Jeremiah he can go anywhere he wanted to go. So you, you got people politically in places and God put people in places because of the intricate workings of government and politics, which we are just backwards. We don't really know how it works. And oftentimes with stuff, we don't know how things work. We paint it all with one brush. But like, for example, there's a war going on right now and people don't realize it because the media have showed people that you know, they made people focus on the person of Trump and stuff like that. And people looking at the person this. Look, I would say this. If people just consider what's happening right now in the American elections, you got to consider deep down in your soul. Why is it that the billionaires are going through such trouble? I mean, if they was all on the same team, I don't think they'd be doing this. The wicked and the capitalists are not all on the same team. That's why they at war. It's like you got a house full of thieves. None of them are friends, for example. But then we got to keep God hand in it because he, every now and again, he puts people in place to help you. But if you don't understand what's in place, you miss out. That's why he said we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. In fact, we not just miss out, we suffer. Okay? It was white people who gave Harriet Tubman a gun to go blast at 
if she needed the Southern aristocracy who didn't want to change. What was that about? That was about the Northern capitalist battle and the Southern capitalist. The, the, to understand politics is important. The Northern capitalist helped Harriet Tubman and a bunch of other so-called black folks to get free from the sinister oppression of antebellum slavery. So when we look at today, brothers and sisters, just look and see what in the world these people have spent all collectively, Bill Gates, George Soros, uh, 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 Bloomberg, man, spent millions of dollars down there in Florida paying off debts of people let out of prison so they can vote. Why? Why? Why are they doing what they're doing now? Why do they shut down these polls and put people out? Is this man in the way? Why is all the media outlets against this, this old man? 74 years old. And they got us. Just, we don't know what the hell going on. But you got to consider why they fighting so hard. So, once we begin to understand what God wants us to do, then we can strategically understand who's for us, who's against us, who don't matter, what we need to do, what we need to push for, what we need to organize for. That's important. But it's not important if you think you're going to be raptured. If It's not important if you think that you ain't got to do nothing and Christ going to come and handle it all, which is a total contradiction of the Bible because Christ came down and said himself, Christ came and said himself, the works that I do, you got to do even greater works than these. Look at his works. What did he do? Why did he meet with rich men? What was he telling the rich men to do? Once the rich men heard his message, why did they break rank and help? Same thing with Paul. In the Greek empire, rich people yielding to the message. Why? What was the man teaching? Why did they, why did rich people join on a Paul? What was he telling them? I'm saying all that because every rich man today, some people looking for repentance. We don't know what's in the chambers. What they thinking about in their chambers? God knows. We didn't know. Mordecai didn't know that uh, Artaxerxes would, wouldn't be able to sleep one night and decided to go through the archives and find out there was a man that spoiled a, an assassination attempt. Mordecai didn't know that. What moved that man? What moved that king heart to make a move? We don't know what's happening in the chambers of the rich men. We must teach. And the only way we will know is if we understand what to look for. And because the most high moved the heart of a hazardous, it saved many Israelites from Ethiopia, Ethiopia to India. But Artaxerxes wasn't no law keeper. Cyrus wasn't no law keeper. So it's work to be done. No one half the battle. And what we got to do, we got to get past and begin to do some diligent research. Because if we don't, we will continue to paint everybody with one brush. But we'll be hypocrites. I want to say this too. We're hypocrites. Because we don't want the rich man to paint all poor people with one brush. You understand? We want the rich man, we don't want other people to paint us all with one brush, but yet we so accustomed to do it to others. All police messed up, right? Every rich man can't, none of them repent. But then we get mad when they, when they call us all predators. And then we get mad when they, when they racial profile us, but we rich profile them. No, they come to repentance, but how can they come to repentance? If no one teaching a message to repent. These are some of the things I argue with. Things I think about. 
that got to be taken into consideration so we can be just judges of the earth and judge according to equity. And that's how we're going to change the world. That's how we're going to change the world. Um, what do you say? So Israel isn't a place, it's a people, it's both. But the uh, primary um, uh, uh, goal, or should I say the primary goal of the prophets is to address the people who is Israel and the city. Um, they, they go to show uh, in a lot of their uh, language and, 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 and uh, prof uh, prophetic, in their prophetic language, they use symbolically the people being Israel or Zion. Yes, but it's both, but yeah. You have to be, you know, pay careful attention when he's talking about Israel and the prophets because he very well could be talking about the organized people. Um, told I for the, thank you so much for that. Um, what we got here? Thank you. Peace, peace. peace. What we got here? Is that Hashem? Yes, sir. How are you doing? Oh, doing. We coming along, my brother. What you got for us? Already. I wanted to uh, share some of the stuff I was, uh, I had found what I was speaking about earlier as far as the uh, Jews being expelled from Timbuktu. Yes, sir. So what I um, found was that Sonny Ali, one of the rulers of the Songhai Empire. Yes. He um, died in 1491 or 92, they believe. And where are you getting a reference from? Where, where are your reference from? Um, I got it from Wiki, but I went to all the references to double check them. Some of them are com coming from foreign books, which aren't in, in print. There's okay. like this French, there's this French book that has a lot of the information in it. And uh, but I, I checked all the references. They were at least, you know, I can't say how true they were, but they were at least real sources. Oh no, no. The reason why I asked you was because sometimes, sometimes when you give it, it just cite the source so people if they want to look it up and get copies themselves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not, I wasn't saying that whether they were true or not, but just pretty much so people just have a reference that they could search it out to. But go ahead. Okay. Um, but yes, he, he passed. They don't know how. And his son, uh, Sonny Burr, Sonny Burr, uh, replaced him. But he only ruled for one year. And he was replaced by Sonny Ali's nephew, who claimed that Sonny Ali's son wasn't islamic enough is that his faith wasn't true and they don't say how he died but you can kind of see that maybe the nephew had something to do with the son dying or not being in rulership anymore like his assassination name, or something yes sir got you his name was um askia muhammad and he started the uh askia dynasty that replaced the sunny dynasty which uh sunny son was the 16th uh ruler of that dynasty and Askia Muhammad, on the advice of his um, advisors, banned jewelry inside of Timbuktu and that um, the dynasty. And he created a, a, a system of trade that was regulated, like how the Europeans do it. Okay. Um, and if and I can, let me just with the brother, with what our brother bringing out this map here, sort of give you a perspective of the area he's talking about. So you see here, this is where my arrow is. It's Timbuktu. Okay, just so people know. All right, so go ahead, brother. I just wanted to show that's why I got the map up so they can get a perspective of where you are. Yes, sir. Like most of Negro land in Guinea that's in that map is definitely uh, part of that empire. And Askia Muhammad expanded it even further. Um, excuse me. But I thought it was interesting that he was so against Jewry at the same year that um, we see the Jews being expelled um, from Spain. You know, it really uh, reinforces that idea of them being a persecuted people right at this time, because we know that's 1492 is also the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yes. Um, so that, you know, Jews in that, in this, you know, north to western Africa area, they were definitely being uh, probably right for the picking because of what was going on um, politically at that time. Excellent point. Excellent point. Excellent point. 
Yeah, but uh, those names are Sonny Ali, Sonny Burr, uh, and Askeel Muhammad, if anybody wants to uh, check more into those people and what was going on at that time. That's an excellent point, Sean. That, 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 that definitely also uh, will be a part of that catalyst to ship these Jews off into slave camps to eventually be led off into captivity to, uh, yeah. onto the Western Hemisphere. Yes, that's very good. I appreciate that that uh, bringing that in. Yeah, and it seems that um, Sonny Ali and, you know, the Sonny Dynasty were at least uh, tolerant of the Jews if they weren't, you know, even part of that um, ethnicity also. Because, I, you know, I consider Islam is just a religion that, you know, was given to, to, to those people down there. So they, you know, very well may have been Jews in rulership inside of these dynasties also. Good point, that's right. Eth the ethnicity would be uh, Israelite or Jewish and their religion would be um, Islam. And it was a lot of that. In fact, Alan Godby explains that. A lot of the Jews ethnically were converted to Islam by force, some of them. So that, that's what you had. That is a fact, according to um, these scholars, yes. Islam or, or, or Muslim in religion, but Jewish Jewish in ethnicity. Yes, Zamanti, that's how you spell Sunny Ali. Right, I'm gonna get off this thing though. Uh, I appreciate the lesson. This whole series has been amazing, man. I've learned so much from it. I really appreciate the, the time and effort you put into it. God bless you, peace, peace. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. Thank you for bringing that information to the table. We appreciate yes, it. Um, anyone else want to ask something? I think that was very good. Brought Sh brought some more stuff out for us. Shalom, 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 shalom. How you doing, big brother? Oh man, I'm trying to hang in there. You know, the struggle goes on. What you got? I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. Um, what really stood out to me was the omelex. This is more so a comment. Um, you know, as it relates to the omelex. Uh huh. I always, like, when I seen him, I always thought of, like, a Goliath head to a certain degree yeah. for whatever reason. And <laughs> and then how everything was brought out tonight, you know what I mean? Everything came full circle. Praise God. Praise God. This is what he making reference to, the Omic heads here. So I'll just go through a little slideshow so people... I don't know if people ever take uh, shots of it, but these are the stone heads that they found in Central and South America. Um, again, that's the uh, front and the back. Out of his helmet, he has braids, six braids we could count here coming out of his helmet here. Um, yeah, it's something. It's a lot of, a lot of history, um, but they couldn't. You can't. I mean, these stones will cry out. Evidence cries out. Stone hedges here. You know. Um, go ahead, my brother. If you, you want to add more, go ahead. You, you, got, you got the floor. Um, uh, that was basically it, um, other than the fact that uh, I thought about, you know, the, the scripture that was brought out speaking to the engraven image. Yes. You know, yeah, I mean, that was profound, you know, as far as uh, these images potentially being made in the likeness of these people who travel to the Americas. And in that, did they allow the natives to make the relics, you know what I mean? Um, That's a good question. Um, in that book, see, in the book that I have, what they have found is that it appears that some of the Aztecs, because they like Quasicoto, uh -huh. that they made these heads uh -huh. of the Negroes. And from, it appears that, uh, that uh, Ivan Van Surma, what he brings to the table is that it really wasn't the Negroes themselves who overseen that work. Right. But it was the worship of the natives who was here who made these stone hedges to worship them out of, and I think they were made out of black 
a, a volcano rock or something like that. Uh -huh. And these were the post, these, they were supposed to have been the men who have come from the land of the sun. Mm. And they, yeah, they, they, they began to, uh, I know I remember reading an account in the book. Um, I don't remember the page right offhand where, yeah, there was the natives who was worshiping the Negro heads. Right. So basically, uh, from, from what it is that we have on record, the uh the, the negroes that they made these heads you know after they they didn't know that the natives was, were, were making these relics or um did they know you it know, doesn't like, i don't know I, I don't recall he didn't state it in the book okay you know so it doesn't because again they still putting pieces of the puzzle together because at one time nobody even talked about these doggone heads yeah, it was just buried in history. They they never acknowledged it. So, I don't know if they have the information now, but it appears that um, from what I read before, he didn't mention whether the Negroes knew or not, but the natives were doing it. You know, some of the heads was around their temples and stuff like that, but he didn't specify whether it was the Negroes themselves sitting on thrones doing this. I don't recall him uh, specifying it. Right, because. My thoughts were, if they did know about it, could they have been separated from the culture that, for so long that they lost sight of the commands? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. I, went, I mean, I, I believe, like, again, many of them who probably came over here were already Muslim. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think that the Negro element over here, even though there was Israelites, like we've been following throughout the world, they held on to certain customs, but they really wasn't fully following as a whole. You may have some of the villages and people was trying to be diligent, but as far as them worshiping other gods and doing some strange stuff, yes, just like we do here. Yeah. 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 And that's intriguing, you know, because um, to some degree, some of my research on how you know, if a person is exiled and or they leave the land of their origin, it only takes a generation and a half for that individual to begin to uh, lose sight of their culture and their heritage. You know, and we can even see, you know, remnants of that. Like, for example, if somebody moves to America from a different country, just one generation, you know, into, like, for example, parents come to America and then they have children who were born here that one generation can be so different from the parents who moved here. I mean, it's really daunting to think about, you know, if and when uh, Israel is exiled to all of its different places, you know, how easy it was to lose sight of who we are and or who we come from, you know, after just one generation and a half, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. You're yeah. right. You are absolutely right. And as you say that, here in New York, um, we were somewhat of a Buffalo, New York is like a refuge city. And uh, many immigrants have come. And um, like the area I live in, uh, I know my mother first moved over there when, when I was younger. And then I, I, didn't, I moved not too far away when I got to be an adult. And me and my wife have been living over there almost 20 years, if not longer. And that's exactly what we've seen from the very first immigrants to their children, totally different. I mean, totally different. It's so messed up that some of them I've tried, but because there's like an, a language barrier, but you can see their culture being just totally stripped and they're becoming Americanized. Oh man, just you said it, like you said, one generation, We've witnessed it. We're witnessing it, I should say. Yeah, man, you are absolutely correct about that. Yep, from Somalia, from Asia. Oh, man, I'm just, just changing to the point where they look like they, they, they ancestors came or, or their parents come here traditionally, you know, got that, you know, old uh, indigenous spirit on them. And you see their kids now, what, 15 to 20 years old, pants sagging, blasting me. I mean, it's strange to see a, 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 a boy from Laos or Asia 
walking around listening to some damn Tupac or something. That was different for me. But that's what we see. That's what's going on. Pants stagging, Jordans. Boys look like, you know, one generation, like you said, that is devastating. That is that you do definitely see it like that. But um uh you got that time on? And I don't know how to do it here. Um but if anyone don't have any other questions, I guess we can get ready to close out for tonight. Uh God willing, our next class studies on the schedule, if he allow. I want to have, uh, it may take a couple of weeks, definitely won't be as long as this one, but I want to take time and I want to go over uh, Thessalonians or the Antichrist. I want to talk about, have a little uh, discussion on the Antichrist and then uh, a few, uh, okay, a few weeks ago, Oh, not a few weeks, a few classes ago, we had talked about doing somewhat of a political analysis in the book of Romans. So if God allowed, we will be going into a discussion on the Antichrist and comparing it old doctrines and what people say today, historical doctrines about the Antichrist, the man of sin. And I just wanna present a different perspective and I'm not presenting it like um, like uh, is end all facts. I just want to bring a perspective to the table that is uh, different from traditional views of Antichrist and a man of sin in Thessalonians. And then from there, God willing, we are going uh, into the book of Romans and begin to do a political analysis of Paul's gospel message to the Romans and analyze that a little bit, okay? So um, you will get an email if we open up a different group. And if not, uh, we, we may use the same group or the same passcode. Um, or, you know, I don't know, we'll let, we, you will get an email, God willing this coming between today and, I mean, between um, so-called the first day of the week and everything God willing be settled by Thursday. You get an email Thursday, whether it be the same passcode entrance or it be a new one, okay? But God willing, we're going to get into that a little bit and hopefully that uh, we can uh, learn together, learn some more things. Thank you so much, everybody. Mother Jennifer, thank you. Thank you. Josiah, all of all of you all who attended tonight, thank you. Shalom, shalom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> shalom. shalom. Good night. Let's stop that. Did you stop it already? No. Oh, later. Hello.